Good morning, and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is uh, Bill Holbrook, and this is my daughter, A.K.H. Glenn. Yep, I am the co-author and the preteen golf consultant. <laughs> and um, we're here to talk about Bethany and the Phantom of the Swim Team, uh, the new graphic novel that is coming out from Hermes Press uh, later this fall. And um, I'd like to uh, just give some background on it. It's the, um, it features the character Bethany from On the Fast Track. Uh, On the Fast Track is a text strip I've been doing for several decades. And um, it's about a company called Fast Track Incorporated, a, a high tech firm that uh, is a cloud company. And um, Bethany is the executive assistant to the CEO, Rose Trellis. She's kind, cheerful, hardworking, conscientious, and very goth. Uh, she in, she um, maintains her style. Um, despite the fact that it violates every dress code the company has. Um, and uh, she's become the main character of Fast Track. I didn't introduce her until 2010 when the strip was already established, but she immediately became a fan favorite and became the main character. Um, I wanted to explore her background, how she uh, came to be how she is, and that was with the support of the president of King Features, um, who that syndicates Fast Track, and um, C.J. Kettner, and she suggested that we do a graphic novel and show how Bethany's tween experiences informed how she came to be the person she is in a professional capacity. So we um, have one, sorry, HH. Yeah. Uh, uh, we sat down and began collaborating on, on the tween um, milieu and uh, created the first Bethany book, which was called Bethany and the Other Click, which we see before us right here. Yeah. It came out in 2021. And it's set when Bethany was 12, and she um, comes into a school which has a very rigid social hierarchy. When you enroll at the school, you are required to declare what clique you belong to. Uh, there's uh, uh, that you can join the jocks or the fashionistas or the anime girls. Um, Bethany is immediately put into the goth clique and finds out that every clique has someone in there that doesn't really belong. They're kind of the outcasts uh, in each clique. So they begin banding together into a clique of their own which is called the other click. That's why the title is Bethany and the other click, because it's all the misfits of the people who don't fit in anywhere else. Um, Bethany comes from a military family, which um, moves around a lot, and therefore she hasn't really put down any roots. So friendship is important to her. Um, she's just moved into this town, doesn't know anyone, and her group of these misfits has become the first real friend she's ever had due to moving around. So this becomes a imperative of her to maintain her friendship with all of the other people in the group. Uh, the first person she meets is Patricia. Um, Patricia has joined the goth clique in the school because she's not goth herself, but she just wants to be left alone. And then Bethany joins, and it turns out they become fast friends. Uh, the next person is Horace. He was in the gaming clique, 
but his games are um, childhood uh, board games like Candyland, which uh, which was why he didn't fit into the gaming clique. Yeah, and the uh, next person that ends up joining the clique is Catalina, who is on the cheer team, but she's more invested in choreographing uh, interpretive dances than adhering to a strict cheer routine. Uh, Warren looks to be a classic goth, but he is completely separate until he beats Bethany. And the question is, how important is his gothiness is to his identity? Because he, he in the first book, had some secrets. And there is Bashir, who is a member of the shop class clique, but has a passion for origami. And the final member of the group is Cho, who's a member of the fashionista clique, but they look down on her because of um, she they don't like her basic style. And she is a um, style is very important to her. And she's finding out who she is, but um, she's also an, an, a very good seamstress. And when she leaves the fashionista group, they lose their best person who actually makes clothes. Now, the first book, um, it ends on the last day of school, um, which leads us to the second book. And that's what we're here to talk about, Bethany and the Phantom of the Swim Team. Because it starts on the very next day after the first book ends, on the first day of summer vacation. And the group um, get, get together. They keep doing things, even though it's the end of school. And um, they still stay together because the group is very important to them. And... Uh, one of the things they do right off is go play miniature golf, which has a goth theme. Um, it's monster golf, with, uh, which, where all the holes are based on horror movies. And um, what happens is that these are all 12-year-olds, so they begin going through changes. Yeah, so um, obviously um, all, they're going through all these changes, so there's going to be some growth spurts, both in uh, height and in uh, otherwise. Uh, they're getting braces. And of course, they are hitting puberty, which uh, ends up being a central conflict for the rest of the book. Uh, Destiny in particular. Yes. So um, one of the things that happen is that the neighborhood has a swim team but there aren't enough swimmers to qualify to have a meet. Um, they've had to forfeit several meets because they didn't have enough swimmers. Um, Patricia is one of the people on the swim team, so she asked Bethany if she can be a swimmer. Outdoor sports are way out of Bethany's comfort zone. Uh, she's very pale of skin and uh, she has to wear a lot of sunscreen. Um, so, um, but she agrees because, like I said, the friendship is really important to her, so she does this for her friends. The coach of the team is a, is a high school senior named Blenny Pike. She's fantastic at swimming. She's the best swimmer in the county. But she has some challenges as far as leadership. Um, that comes into play. And um, as the team comes in, um, the group becomes involved with the team, including Cho the seamstress making the uniforms for the team. The team hadn't had uniforms. Uh, Cho steps up and ma makes uniforms for everyone. 
And, and the team is called the Selkies, uh, which was a change from their previous name, which was the Bottom Feeders. As the summer goes on, however, vandalism starts to occur. Um, the diving board is um, vandalized and other things start happening. And Bethany, being such an outsider, begins to be accused of the crimes by other people on the team who don't know her. Therefore, Bethany and the group have to find out who's conducting the vandalism and why that's happening. Uh, as they conduct, as they discover clues during this who done it um they discover that things are happening that don't in, that, that are far beyond just the swim team itself that involves the whole neighborhood um it begins to have far wider implications um that whole, puts the whole neighborhood at stake And yeah, that, that's the neighborhood. And um, I really can't go on any further without being spoilerish. So we'll, so, so that's the setup behind Bethany and the Phantom of the Swim Team, finding out who the Phantom is and why the vandalism is occurring. And over the course of the summer, the uh, student, the uh, group finds out things about themselves, and um, it's both an inner and outer journey. And HH? -H. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so for the collaborative process, it really was just uh, the two of us getting together, sitting down, and um, we kind of pulled a little bit from uh, our, our own past in regards to um, my time on the swim team and as a preteen goth and how we would work uh, that previous experience into Daphne's uh, world. We would basically get together when HH claim came over to our house, as she often does. She also lives here in Atlanta. And we would get together on a Sunday and sit in my office and discuss the um we would we, we would build this world. This was a very much a world building process. Yeah. Um, we would talk about what kind of neighborhood this was. Um, well, I'm just um, don't want to get uh, too far into spoilers. Yeah. But yeah, um, you know, uh, I see a, a huge uh, factor in this story in particular is Daphne growing up and getting older and some and um, I'm a bit closer to my preteen years than you are, so I got so I um, had to put in my two cents in regards to maybe a scene need to be rewritten or a piece of dialogue need to be changed. Yeah, yeah. it was very much a collaboration, as especially as far as Daphne's um, physical journey during this summer. Yeah, being a twelve-year-old, and um, we started putting the plot together um without really knowing where it was leading and um the characters kind of determined that because mm -hmm. we had the characters set up from the first book not just the other click but some of the antagonists and they that provided the framework but it, it also involved um her experiences mm -hmm. at our neighborhood in suburban Atlanta, where she grew up, mm -hmm. and uh, she was on the swim team for that. And um, it, it, in fact, when I drew the um, the pool, it was very much the um, memories of the pool back in our old neighborhood, uh, which we happened to live across a cul-de-sac from. Um, so it was very much drawing on experiences. Mm -hmm. 
So something that I have noticed um, a lot in like really popular pieces of media that um, are aimed towards a goth audience, I've noticed that a large trend is to have an excuse for the goth character to be goth. That usually it's established that they had some big traumatic event and they're in active mourning and that's why they're now goth and that's really not an accurate depiction on what being goth is and what and why the goth subculture is so appealing to so many people it's they it doesn't really need to have an excuse of going through trauma it can be finding beauty and the dark and the macabre and i really want to and um through the um writing Daphne, i wanted to put emphasis on that young people can be attracted to those uh to that subculture without needing a dark excuse to um to embrace gothness And, you know, the OG goths are getting a bit older now, and we have noticed that um, a lot of um, big mainstream companies are now trying to market towards goths. Like, I've seen, um, like, skeleton and spiderweb themed crockpots or diapers with cobwebs on them. And so, like, now i've noticed that goths are kind of getting to be like you know your parents click so we really want to make sure that there's um we want to like make stories about goths that appeal to our younger goths um the world and this gets into who the uh, market is for for our book uh we see it as um um tweens and up that for that age group that Destiny is depicted in and also uh fans of fast track who have followed Destiny all along so it is very much tweens and up and that's it for our prepared remarks and we are open for q a <laughs> Is it better to buy it? Is it better to buy books directly from you or through Amazon? Do you come out better which way? Uh, buying books directly from me, definitely. Okay. Be because I might get pennies on the sale from Amazon. Okay. Is and, and it's autographed. <laughs> yeah. Um, unfortunately, we don't have copies of this book as it won't be out until later in the fall. Yep. But you can pre-order it off Hermes Press. Okay. Uh, on their website, um, I'll, I'll hand you one of the uh, um, yeah. cards, which has the QR code, and okay. that goes to the Hermes Press pre-order page, and that will. Um, you can order it off then. Okay. Second question. Mm -hmm. How do you do three daily shots? <laughs> well, yeah, I also do, um, and aside from on the fast track, I also do Kevin and Kel and Safe Havens. Um, and I've been doing this for, since 1995, since uh, Kevin and Kel came along. And basically I work on a three week schedule. Um, just for example, this week I'll be writing fast track strips, gags, gags for fast track, while drawing up the Kevin and Kel strips I wrote last week. And I won't even be thinking of safe havens. At when the next week comes along, I'll be drawing up all of those fast track strips and have a three weeks worth of fast track to send into king features while then writing for safe havens and 
it, the cycle goes on. And this is what is really valuable is the week I take off between the time I write the strips and the time I draw them up because I come back to them after being away and see, oh, I can punch up this gag. I know how this gag can work better by stepping away from it for a number of days. I have some distance and I'm able to make changes and I do this with probably every single strip. There's something that I change between the pencil rough sketch and the final ink. Um, then I um, show it to my wife, Terry, and um, I will then um, she will proofread them. And um, then I send them on. And the um, King Features people are really grateful for that because they told me at the Rubens Awards last week where, when I met them that I'm one of the people who send in the fewest numbers of mistakes. And uh, that's, that's because Terry catches them all. I make all the mistakes. I make, I make them frequently. She catches them before the King Features people do. Any more Q&A? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I didn't know short, we could almost do it. Yeah. <laughs> second for the second round. <laughs> That's up to you. Yeah. you want to wrap. Well, um, we can give you the condensed version. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you, you know, fast track, of course. I, yeah. Yeah, it, Yes, yes, he he comes every con. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back. One of my regulars, uh, and I do appreciate that. Um, but we're talking about first of all the introduction to the first book, which um, we um, introduced in twenty twenty one. About and Bethany's tween years. Bethany's tween years. I don't get, I don't yes. Yep. 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 So the second book. Bethany and the Phantom of the Swim Team begins the day after the first book ends on the last day of school. So the second book becomes, it, it, it comes into play right after the day, the day after the first book ends. So it's like the first day of summer vacation. And we meet Patricia's family. We meet Bethany's family, the military family that has um, moved around a lot so that Bethany becomes very attached to the friends that she made in the, in the first book. Mm -hmm. And she's worried about leaving the first friends she's had, really. And she um, suspects that her family's going to be moving again. And this makes her want to spend more time with her friends, which includes joining the swim team, which is important because the swim team doesn't have enough swimmers to qualify for meets. They've had to can, um, forfeit some of the meets. And um, so she joins the swim team, even though outdoor sports are not in her wheelhouse. And the team is able to perform, but then vandalism starts happening. And Bethany, being the outsider, um, begins to be blamed. She um, Things occur and people suspect her. So the group and Bethany have to clear her name and it becomes a whodunit of who's actually doing the vandalism and what their motives are. And it becomes to involve the entire neighborhood. It becomes bigger than just a swim team. It involves, it, it, it has far wider implications than that as the mystery goes on. And um, yeah, that's as far as I can go without spoilers. <laughs> can I do a question? Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
Okay. Um, I've been a long time reader mm -hmm. and I've noticed some uh, uh, patterns and uh, 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 pretty much uh, 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 tropes yes. in uh, uh, a lot of the uh, different cartoons of the mini you make. <laughs> uh, I've noticed that uh, 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 with uh, the newest uh, 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 intonation, they're not really taking over like uh, uh, the old uh, uh, days where uh, uh, you'd introduce the kids and the kids would pretty much take over or mm -hmm. become uh, uh, the main characters. You've been focusing a lot on uh, 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 the main characters and all of them. Mm -hmm. And Destiny definitely took over the yeah. entire mm -hmm. uh, 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 topic. And you've avoided any sort of... Uh, 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 the next generation with her mm -hmm. uh, uh is that on purpose is it you were trying to break the tropes or uh, uh is it just the way it uh, uh organically uh came out very organically this wasn't um a um grand intention on my part i was basically just following the characters as they took the lead i know in um safe havens uh, i've introduced more characters uh, as the um, kids have grown up and have, have gone through their lives in real time. Um, with Fast Track, it was, definitely happened very much by accident. Um, I introduced her with some, I figured I could, I could do some goth um, gags and then she would reveal herself to be someone else. And as soon as I started doing the death any things, um, I was showing them to my wife, Terry, and um, I was, first of all, finding out these, she was very easy to write for. I knew her in, intimately right from the start. And then Terry suggested my idea of her being revealed to be someone else was not the thing to do so that just confirmed what I was suspecting. So my in original intention of her being just a disguise of, of another character uh, went out the window and she and, and I became building her as a character. And when the script started coming out, the readers ag agreed. I started getting more reader feedback on her than I had ever gotten on any character I'd ever done in Fast Track. Um, people, I would, I would get emails from just people just saying, I love Destiny. <laughs> <laughs> and even at the, um, first few cons we went to after we published the first book, just, we nearly sold out of that first Destiny book. And I remember <clears throat> someone even came up to the table, congratulating you from getting, for getting syndicated because apparently he had just never seen or never paid attention to uh the comic until Destiny showed yeah he, yeah that was at, at Otakon he thought it was a new comic strip and that he really liked not realizing it had been in the strip for years previously because he just never noticed it but something about her as a character was very striking and um that has really enabled Fast Track to um take another level uh, if you're still taking questions, yeah. are you ever going to get back to uh, uh, some of the more fantastical elements of uh, uh, the uh, fast track? Uh, like the universe? goat monster? Yeah. Well, what what happened, and 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 this is the direct result of um, Destiny coming along. I realized that she works well in the real world because she gets a lot of reaction from the other characters in a real world setting so what happened all the fantastical elements in fast track are now in cyberspace Destiny's avatar is a goth unicorn and um, the, the other characters all have avatars in cyberspace so when i want to do fantastical things it's them being online and interacting in in on social media and in cyberspace and 
depicted literally, but you know they're really just typing at their computers. Um, that seems to work well because I have a real world where things happen that can ha that can happen that readers identify with, but I'm also able to do fantastical things because Destiny is very imaginative. That's part of her character. So we've we've lost the moat monster. Um, if people ask me about her, I'd say, well, she's she's a human now. Uh, she um, I still show a woman in the strip with green hair. That's the moat monster. Um, Kevin and Kel, mm -hmm. the uh, um, changing uh, uh, of uh, uh, species is, is that an allegory for uh, uh, the trans community? And if it is, do you get the negative end of that with people being morons? Um, I haven't gotten any response. I mean, it's obvious. I, I make it obvious that uh, the character of Bruno, who has had surgery to change himself from a carnivore to a herbivore, he had um, extra stomachs installed in his digestive system. That was his surgery. Um, he, he is now a ram, where he used to be a wolf. And he deals with the um, conflicts that people in the trans community have to deal with about how other people react to him. Um, he and his wife, Corey, um, have adopted a, a child who's a chameleon. And the uh, spawn services in Kevin and Kel put a lot of roadblocks in front of them. Before, before they could adopt. Uh, it turns out that it they were approved and they have a very loving family. And um, I don't know, maybe my audience and Kevin and Kel know where I'm going so, so they don't, so that I don't have people who would complain about it because Kevin and Kel from the very start, the very first strip uh, has been about people coming together because uh, Kevin is a rabbit, Kel is a wolf, and their relationship from the start has been about breaking taboos and um, being about inclusion and everything that that, that entails. So the strip from the beginning um, has been preparing for issues like this. So I, I don't think I have a lot of... Um, people who would complain that read the strip regularly. You did miss an excellent 80s uh, uh, reference by not naming the baby Karma. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Karma Chameleon. <laughs> but, but well, her, 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 her name is Carla. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's all I got. Okay. Right. Anything else? I do want to thank you both for coming. Yes, yes thank you. <laughs> All the fast track. Where do you get your corporate insights? Uh, he deals with the corporation. <laughs> well, yes. But, but the view inside corporations is very different from outside. Yeah, and I worked at the AJC. Okay. Um, I worked at the AJC when the Constitution merged with the journal. I was on the art staff. And the two, and the two, um, the 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 entire two staffs merged. So there was all this office politics and yes. backbiting and backstabbing, as if people were jockeying to maintain their their positions in the new uh, hierarchy. So we in the art department just were you know eating popcorn and while watching all this. So um, that's that was in '82, and it was in late '82 when I started developing Fast Track because I had all this stuff I was observing, and it had a lot of material. So it every once in a while you'll you'll have a, a comic that really strikes so true. <laughs> um, 
I spent 40 years in the manufacturing business mm -hmm. and the the conflict between executives mm -hmm. was always yeah yeah everyone was jockeying to maintain their position rather than what the real corporate goal is put in front of them so yeah that was a direct observation um regarding trellis she is set up as uh, um, both a villain mm -hmm. and a mother figure. Mm -hmm. um, how do you ju juggle making her human and making her a monster at the same time? Well, she represents the corporation. Her 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 character is that of an avatar of the corporate culture. But as a character, um, she does have some attributes. She is not totally villainous. Um, the best way I can describe Rose is that her lens is entirely through that of power. And when she has a conflict she says how can this rebound so that i have more power um that's the lens that she sees the world through so she has a, a acquired power that comes from being a billionaire uh she um fast track is now the world's preeminent cloud computing company which she took from she originally inherited Fast Track from her father, and upon his death, it was just a um, agricultural supply company. And she took it in a different direction into being a tech company and has taken it into heights that her father never could have dreamed of. Um, that, that said, she very much honors her father by knowing that that's, he provided the seed that she grew from, both in physically and in the terms of the corporation. Um, so she's not entirely villainous, but she just represents the corporation, especially in an era when we're in late stage capitalism. It is through Wendy and Dethany that Rose doesn't go beyond um, actual breaking the law. They show her where the guardrails are. Um, and Rose kind of knows that. She won't admit it, but she doesn't go beyond what would make Dethany or Wendy um leave the company because they have their own moral ethics and if rose crossed a line they would leave so i think rose does know where the line is she's a complicated character Okay. Okay. Well, I thank you so much for coming. It's yeah, thank uh, you. Oh, uh, 313, 313 in the Artist Alley. Okay. I wish I had the books to sell, but that'll be later on. It, uh, so, yeah, here, you can go ahead and have a. You're welcome. And thank you all again for yes. coming in on a Sunday morning. I do appreciate it.